Senior investigative reporter Ken Klippenstein is with us this morning for TYTI Daily, talking about a story that he broke just this morning uh, at TYT Investigates. The story is about President Trump's nominee to be his new defense secretary. That guy is Mark Esper. He's a former executive with Raytheon. And the story that Ken broke this morning has to do with his wife and what his wife does for a living. Uh, specifically, she works for an industry trade group that deals with military contracting, lobbies the Pentagon, um, and has gotten contracts of its own. So, uh, Ken, good morning. Congratulations on the story. Hey, Jonathan. Thank you. So, um, uh, it, I assume I, I got the broad strokes right there in, in describing what your story is this morning? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so so Mark Esper, he's the nominee. He's currently Secretary of the Army. Give us, give us what he, the scope of his background has been um, up to and including where he is now. Well, he has a pretty impressive um, degree of experience in uh, defense generally, um, not just in the military where he was, uh, you know, as you pointed out, Secretary of the Army, and then before that had been at the DOD for, you know, years and years. He's also been at some of the top um, defense contractors in the country. So he was um, at Raytheon, which is, according, you know, people measure these things different ways, but it's definitely within the top five uh, defense contractors in terms of uh, you know, revenue and, and profits and things like that. So this is an enormous conglomerate. And uh, he served as a registered lobbyist for Raytheon when he was there. And, um, you know, if you go through his history, there's uh, several other places like that. that he was. So he's been in public sector, private sector, in the defense, the military industrial complex, moving back and forth, sort of classic revolving door. Textbook revolving door, exactly. And at some point, I believe you reported that it was 2009, his wife got a job uh, that's that's relevant to this. Tell us tell us what happened if I've got that date right in 2009. Yeah, so um, in 2009 she she uh, joined what's called the Design Build Institute of America uh, DBIA, and um, as as you said, this is an industry trade group that um, kind of make a long story short, it works construct has a, it has a sort of unorthodox approach to construction um, and because of that it issues licenses it has you know it promotes this particular um, approach to construction and um, among its members um, is are you know all of these huge government contractors including military contractors um, and so on and um, it, you know it had a it had a big role in the renovation of the Pentagon uh, you know some years back and um, if you look at um, the uh, different kinds of construction that it's had a hand in. It's there's been quite a few very large contracts. And so she joined uh, as executive director for the Mid Atlantic region of DBIA in 2009, as you reported, when her husband already had a lengthy career in this same industry, right? Yeah, that's right. And what makes things a little stranger was I couldn't find any evidence that she had experience um, relevant to um, government contracting or military contracting whatsoever prior to her being um, appointed executive director. And that seemed a little odd to me. Um, I, you know, obviously people's careers change, uh, you move through different fields. But um, and I, you know, I asked for comment um, from her to, you know, provide any evidence to the contrary or correct the record never got back to me. I tried to get her to, you know, comment several times. But um, what I found was um, that not just that she didn't have um, experience in construction, but, you, you know, she had been uh, a busy homer, homemaker for a number of years, which there's nothing wrong with, but that does um, raise questions to me um, as to, you know, was she, was she qualified for this position um, when she had been appointed? Because to become executive director of a major um, institute and also a branch that covers Virginia, D.C., Maryland, where all of these huge um, government and specifically defense contracts are going to be going on, um, one would think that, you know, you'd have to have some experience to do that. And you, but you actually did find one other uh, aspect of her, her CV, right, which may not have been a job, but kind of, you reported in this story, it kind of jumped out at me, and I'm not saying it because I don't want to give it away because it's so much fun, but can you <laughs> walk through what you found? Um, are, are you referring to how she was a golf instructor prior to <laughs> prior to all this, that's the only other job that I could find. Which so again, there's right. So she went yeah. from being a golf instructor. It's not clear, I guess, whether that was a professional thing or was just a hobby, but golf instructor, and according to his testimony, a homemaker. And then in 2009, 
right around the same time, I guess he became um, went to Raytheon, became a high level executive at, at Raytheon. Maybe a year before, I don't remember. But I think it was two years before. Yeah. Two years before, and then all of a sudden, she's now executive uh, director of the Mid Atlantic region of DBIA. Um, and so, one thing you alluded to earlier that I wanted you to get to to get you to explain a little bit is. Um, I think when people think about military contracts and stuff, they imagine that the Pentagon draws up a contract that says, okay, we need a new plane and we need it built um, to these specifications. Give us your bid and tell us how much money you can do it for. And then, and then the bids actually roughly consist of, here's the amount of money I can do it for. And then the Pentagon can say, okay, well, you came in cheapest, but you said you'd use proper materials, so we'll go with your bid. DBIA, has been very active. Their whole point of being uh, is to essentially introduce an entirely new way for contractors to submit bids. And I want you to explain both exactly what that is that they're doing differently and why some people in law enforcement have some questions about that, if you could explain that. Yeah, so instead of just going with the cheapest, you know, soliciting, saying we need this, and then going with the cheapest, um, you know, person that applies, um, the way DBIA has done it is they have everyone um, submit unique bids, and um, you know proponents will say that that streamlines the process for various reasons. And oh, that, but when you say unique bids, bids, not just unique bid amounts, they're actually they're actually coming up with the entire specifications that would normally be exactly. in the contract, right? So it's, no, so they're all these bids are for totally different job not not totally different but for very different right. specifications. Yeah, I have that right. Yeah, and that makes it very difficult. Um, to you know, compare these things and, and and make a decision, you know, and make a decision in a kind of like, uh, how would you say, um, you know, evidence-based way, because a lot of these things are just not able to be compared because the construction specifications will differ so much. And in the story, I include a sort of case study of of how this has played out in a Los Angeles school district where they allocated there was a huge boondoggle. They allocated millions of dollars to reconstruction of this thing. And the um, district attorney ended up looking into it and wondering, you know, what went wrong? Why is there so much money going to this thing that never that took years to be completed? And he blamed it on the design build process that DBA specializes in, saying that, um, you know, they proposed all of these, you know, wildly different um, kind of design proposals, and they ended up going with the most expensive one. And uh, he said that it was just very difficult uh, by the nature of design build to be able to, he said it just opens the door to corruption because um, then you can, uh, it's, it's easier to justify buying a more expensive bid because you can be like, well, it's different for X, Y, and Z, and this is superior for these reasons. So we should go with the most expensive one. And in fact, that's what happened. They went, they ended up going with by far the most expensive bid. It erases the capacity to make a direct comparison, which sort of opens the door for you to justify accepting whichever bid you want. But I, I should say you actually include DBIA has its own, obviously, they have their reasons why they believe this is, uh, at least sometimes, a superior way of doing things. So in fairness, we should, we should, you should say a little bit about what they say is the reason for doing this, at least sometimes. Yeah, so proponents of design build, it's become more popular. Um, it used to be quite unorthodox. Um, they say that, you know, with these unique specifications that different, uh, you know, bidders can pitch, that that allows for more creativity in the process, a little more wiggle room in terms of, you know, maybe the initial uh, request from the Pentagon or whoever, you know, wasn't exactly what it should be. Um, and in addition to that, they do claim that it can be um, cheaper. It's sort of complicated, but it streamlines the process all under um, one, you know, group as opposed to the more traditional method of having a kind of almost adversarial or competitive relationship between the, um, I think it's the designer and 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 the contractor, but um, long story short, they you know they they you know they'll they'll claim otherwise, but um, but but there's evidence to the contrary as well. And so Esper, the the White House just recently announced that Esper is going to be his nominee. Um, and can you uh, explain for folks exactly what happens next in this process? Trump has said I'm going to nominate him. We're going to get the formal nomination. What happens then? Yeah, so sort of astonishing backstory here. Um, the um, Patrick Shanahan, which who was supposed to be the you know defense secretary, ended up being um, ended up withdrawing his 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 nomination uh, because of frankly horrifying um, allegations of um, domestic abuse. 
but that's you know <laughs> it's in the past now i guess um the um, he was a, a what, boeing executive right Do I that's have right a, another yeah, yeah another defense contractor right. right and so now um with esper um president trump just formally announced his nomination on i believe it was saturday or sunday so this is very much up in the air it's not at all decided yet that this um you know person will be able to go through the process and the Senate process is, uh, you know, indeed lengthy and, um, you know, he'll have to file new disclosures and things. So I would, you know, encourage anyone interested in this to, to, to keep abreast of that and we'll certainly be reporting on it um, so going the forward, next, but there's a lot. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. The next step, I mean, he hasn't even had a, you know, confirmation hearing or anything yet. So, so it goes to the Armed Services Committee and then they take in all this information, these disclosure forms, they get information right. from him. He's got to essentially testify about, here's my income, here's my wife's income. And then the senators, they get him up there and they can ask him questions about anything they want, in including your story now. Is that roughly right? Absolutely. But we don't know the time frame for that yet. They haven't announced any of these we things. don't have a good sense of that yet, yeah. Okay. And President Trump has drawn it out so much with the Previous, uh, you know, Shanahan, he wasn't even actually the defense secretary. He was in limbo for, you know, quite a while. Um, Acting. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, Ken, thanks so much for uh, joining us for TYTI Daily. And um, thank you, everyone, for watching. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel, please do that. You can also follow us uh, on Facebook, like us on Facebook. And uh, Tuesday through Fridays, we're usually live here on YouTube, which means um, whether it's Ken or I doing this, we'll take your questions. We'll actually have a conversation about the stories that we're talking about, about TYT, uh, anything you want. Um, we'll be there answering questions. Ken's going to be uh, filling in for me a lot more um, in, the in the next few weeks. Uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of him and maybe me a few times uh, over the next few weeks as well. But um, either way, thanks for joining and have a great weekend. Weekend? Did I just say weekend? <laughs> Have a great week. I'm already on vacation. It'd be cool, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We're heading for a one-day week. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. I, I'm glad I fact-checked fact myself in the moment there. All right, everyone. Have a good week, and we'll see you tomorrow here at QITI Daily. Bye.